Okay, so today we're going to look at deviance in sports and specifically focus on eating disorders. I think when we say deviance in sports, topics such as domestic violence, cheating, and drug use, such as performance enhancing drugs, come quickly to our minds. That's why I like to look at other deviant areas within sports. Although we're probably somewhat familiar with eating disorders, as sports professionals, I believe it's important to build a more thorough understanding of the social and cultural expectations that drive this form of deviant overconformity. So first, we're going to define anorexia nervosa and bulimia. Anorexia nervosa is characterized by self-starvation and excessive weight loss, while bulimia is characterized by a secretive cycle of binge eating following followed by purging. So bulimia includes eating large amounts of food, more than most people would eat in one meal, in short periods of time, then getting rid of that food or calories through vomiting, laxative abuse, or over-exercising. So when we talk about anorexia, let's give a few symptoms or indicators of a person who is suffering from anorexia. Um, intense fear of weight gain or being fat feeling fat or overweight despite dramatic weight loss, extreme concern with body weight and shape, refusal to eat in front of others, um, dry skin, thin scalp hair, uh, confused or slow thinking, uh, an individual may have poor memory and lack of judgment. You also see ritualistic eating, and this would be cutting food into small pieces. Again, gives the illusion of eating but the person really isn't. Some symptoms or indicators of bulimia are repeated episodes of binging and purging, um, feeling out of control during a binge and eating beyond the point of comfortable fullness, extreme concern with body weight and shape. Sometimes you'll see some evidence such as discarded packaging of laxatives, diet pills, emetics, these are drugs that induce vomiting, or diuretics, and these are meds that reduce fluids. Regularly going to the bathroom immediately after meals. Suddenly eating large amounts of food or buying large quantities that disappear right away. Now I have a teenager, so that's happening all the time, but in all seriousness, that is a symptom of uh, bulimia where they buy a lot of food and then it disappears relatively quickly. Another one is compulsive exercising. And there are some physical signs with bulimia. There's broken blood vessels in the eyes. This is from the strain of vomiting. Cavities, diseased gums, enamel erosion, rashes and pimples, um, small cuts and calluses across the tops of finger joints. So again, we've gone over some of the symptoms of anorexia and bulimia. So now I wanna take a moment and just give you a few statistics. Every time I talk about these, I still find these just amazing and fascinating. Anorexia is the third most common chronic illness among adolescents. Unfortunately, only one in 10 men and women with eating disorders receive treatment. There's a lot of stigma associated with having an eating disorder, especially more so for male athletes because it's seen as a female issue. This is one that I find just compelling. Eating disorders have the highest mortality rate of any mental illness. The mortality rate associated with anorexia nervosa is 12 times higher than the death rate associated with all causes of death for females 15 to 24 year olds, 15 to 24 years old. This is primarily the result of what it physically does to the body, malnutrition the heart tissue cannibalizes itself. So the most common occurrence is a heart attack. So essentially the body is eating itself and um, causes death. There are large numbers of people who are male that suffer from anorexia or bulimia. But as I said earlier, men are less likely to seek treatment for eating disorders because of the perception that they are women's diseases. We also see the role that advertising plays in the media. The body type portrayed in advertising as the ideal is possessed naturally by only 5% of American females. 
I find this next information staggering. 47.2% um, of girls in fifth through 12th grade reported wanting to lose weight because of magazine pictures. 69% of girls in fifth through 12th grade reported that magazine pictures influenced their idea of a perfect body shape. And this one really just blew me away, especially as a person who coaches teens and um, younger individuals. 81% of 10 year olds are afraid of being fat. These statistics illustrate the importance of the media on individuals' perceptions of body type. So how is this compounded for athletes? So to illustrate, I'm going to list a series of questions and then discuss the answers. Make sure you watch the links that are included here, as well as the ones that I've included in the supplemental material. These links provide additional information and insight into eating disorders. So the first question is why are eating disorders more prevalent among athletes in general? So think about this, in your opinion, what risk factors make athletes more susceptible to eating disorders? To answer this, let's think about the characteristics and attitudes of elite athletes. Perfectionism, goal-oriented, success at any cost, high self-expectations, competitiveness, a preoccupation with weight and dieting, and a tendency toward depression. These are all traits found in those with anorexia as well. This is a really fascinating statistic. A study of NCAA trainers found that 91% of them believed that they had encountered an athlete with an eating disorder. Our articles on D2L give more information about athletes and eating disorders. Um, you know, please make sure that you review them. Our second question is in what sports are athletes more susceptible to eating disorders? The first sport is the lean sport. So these are sports with a weight class requirement or sports where a low body weight or lean body is believed to give a competitive advantage. So we can see this with gymnastics, diving, rowing, ballet, running, cycling, jockeying, horse jockeys, uh, wrestling, martial arts, and swimming. Think about figure skating, dance, and diving. Often there is a focus on appearance and on the individual athlete rather than the team. Along with lean sports, we also see that judged sports um, is a sport where there's more eating disorders. The prevalence of eating disorders in judged sports is actually 13% compared to 3% in refereed sports. The reason is the subjectivity of the judging system and the focus on the aesthetics of the athlete in the sport. Think back to the article that we read on media and framing and the descriptors that were used for diving. Graceful, clean, beautiful. You know, let's look at this with gymnastics. Um, again, we see this in with figure skating. But why might gymnasts be more vulnerable to eating disorders? First, the routines have become more demanding and athletic over time. And for females, going through puberty and developing hips and breasts may hinder their performance. For gymnasts and other young athletes, puberty brings with it changes in height, weight distribution, and their center of gravity that can impact your body image. It can throw you off balance, literally, and interfere with your performance. Over the past 30 years, elite gymnasts have become significantly younger and smaller in terms of body size and weight. In the 1964 Olympics, the all-around title was won by 26-year-old Vera Kozlowska. She was 5'3 and weighed 121 pounds. In the 1993 Olympics, Shannon Miller won the all-around title, 16 years old, 4'10, 79 pounds. Gabby Douglas in the 2012 Olympics, 4'11, 90 pounds, 16 years old. And then if you look at Simone Biles, I believe she is only 4'10 and again, young. 
Another factor in eating disorders with athletes, specifically gymnastics, is coaching. Many coaches are very authoritarian, and this can occur in any sport, and they dictate a great portion of the athlete's lives. Coaches are seen as role models, and athletes have a very strong desire to please them. Some elite athletes started very young, at a time when they're very impressionable. So a recommendation from a coach to lose weight may be seen as a requirement for improved performance. One study I read discussed former gymnasts. One gymnast said her club coach would punish team members if they exceeded their assigned weight. They were verbally abused, denied meals, and at times confined to a fat room. Gymnasts are under immense pressure from parents, peers, and coaches to maintain a lithe body image while continually striving to improve performance. And the stress increases as the sport becomes more competitive. For many young gymnasts, eating disorders and excessive training can lead to delayed puberty and menstrual disorders. According to a 2007 study, Italian study published in Pediatric Exercise Science. Another study of adolescent dancers and gymnasts published in the Journal of Dance Medicine and Science found pressures to please parents and a drive for perfectionism were negative stressors for gymnasts. Here's another link. It has information about healthy body image and some videos about athletes and eating disorders. It's www.olympic.org backslash HBI, and I'll have that on our D2L site. So eating disorders, though, are not unique to gymnastics. Let's look at another sport. Horse racing is another sport that most of us probably don't think about often, but it, too, is characterized by a prevalence of eating disorders. A large part of jockey's success is making weight and staying light enough to ride based on limitations set by racing officials. Said one jockey, quote, We have to be smaller, skinnier, and lighter, and stronger at the same time. End quote. There's another video related to this that's also available on your D2L site. Horse racing is interesting because there are no rules in racing that address weight reduction methods. To make weight, jockeys will vomit. This is called flipping and heaving. Locker rooms actually have heave bowls in them and hot boxes to sweat off pounds. Also, racetracks set their own weight ranges, so a jockey's weight can fluctuate based on where he or she is racing. For example, for the Kentucky Derby, jockeys can weigh 126 pounds, but most weight assignments are between 110 and 114 pounds. Now, the Jockeys Guild is pushing for racetracks to agree to a standard minimum weight of 118 pounds with body fat levels no less than 5%, and that's a way to help try and minimize um, starving the body to make weight. Here's an interesting quote. The fear is that there will always be someone out there who is willing to do damage to their body for the competitive advantage, and only a culture change can alter that background acceptance of unhealthy behavior, end quote. This is a great sociological quote because it illustrates the power and relevance of social and cultural factors in promoting what's seen as healthy and ideal. To further illustrate this, let's look at males and eating disorders and the role of media. Sports that call for weight restrictions, gymnastics, diving, swimming, wrestling, and track, put male participants at risk for developing an eating disorder. Male wrestlers have a higher rate of eating disorders than the male population at large. They, as do female athletes, often believe that losing weight will improve their chances of winning. However, food restriction and fluid deprivation creates an adverse physiologic uh, effect on the body, and often the wrestler is too weak to, com to compete. Now, I have a link to a clip by MMA fighter Tommy Truex. This is a really down-to-earth discussion of eating disorders, so make sure that you view this. Male wrestlers feel they need to lose excess body fat. However, when we've looked at high school wrestlers, they have body fat levels in the 8 to 11% range, while peers average 15% body fat. 
1998, three collegiate wrestlers died while trying to cut or lose weight. To lose weight, typical ways to do this are fasting, using saunas to steam weight off, and using rubber or plastic suits to sweat off pounds. The NCAA developed new rules to curb extreme weight loss tactics. It added six pounds to every weight class, moved weigh-ins closer to the start of each competition and established a minimum wrestling weight based on body fat composition at the beginning of the season. There's been a slight but positive effect, credited in part to efforts by coaches and fellow wrestlers to educate the athletes about eating disorders and weight loss tactics. In addition, the American College of Sports Medicine recommends that male athletes 16 years and younger with body fat below 7% and those over 18 with a body fat lower than 5.6% um, receive medical clearance before they're allowed to compete. Another population with a high rate of eating disorders is gay males. 42% of males with eating disorders identify themselves as gay. So what might be contributing to an increase in eating disorders in males? One factor is the media. Male muscularity in the media is having as much of a negative impact as female images. What we're seeing is that social norms for men have evolved to buffed bodies that emphasize strength, athleticism, and a perfect BMI, or body mass index. We've really seen a change in a, an increased focus on men looking buff now, a real message being sent by the media and the models. One issue that impacts male athletes more than females is a pathologic preoccupation with becoming muscular. And this affects men in sports such as bodybuilding and football, those that stress size and strength. Another difference between males and females is we see that male bulimia often centers on exercise compulsion. Exercise compulsively as a means for purging or weight control. It's hard to measure eating disorders in men since more research is done with women. Also, coaches and players don't really talk about it. If you go into female locker rooms, it's very typical to see information displayed such as signs to look for and other information posted. In male locker rooms, you don't see that. So it's important for male athletes and male coaches to become more aware of eating disorders and to also make each other more aware in the hopes that as awareness increases, incident, incidences will decrease. Now here are some other findings regarding eating disorders. Athletes with eating disorders may be able to function at a high level, but often there is significant disturbance in thought and mood and eventually health. Dara Torres, an Olympic swimmer, said, quote, The worst part of my bulimia was its psychological effect. Sure, I had no energy in the water and my face was bloated. But the real problem was that I lost my mind. I was extremely dark and moody. Pretty much all I thought about during college was what I ate, what I wanted to eat, what other people ate, what I'd need to do to get rid of the calories I'd ingested, how much exercise I got, and how I would look in my swimsuit when I mounted the blocks." End quote. There are severe physical consequences of an eating disorder. Injuries brought on by lack of caloric intake and an impaired healing process. For females, there's the female athlete triad. This is interrelated symptoms of disordered eating, menstrual irregularity, and low bone mass. When an athlete eats too few calories, it causes brain hormone levels to change, disrupting signals to the ovaries to produce estrogen. Estrogen is key to bone, to bone development. 90% of peak bone mass is attained by age 18. So for females, quote, disrupting the menstrual cycle during adolescence and early adulthood has a profound ethic, I'm sorry, profound effect on bone health, end quote. So what do we do? Have you ever told someone they needed to lose weight or lower their percentage of body fat? Were you ever told this as an athlete? Many athletes have been told to do this, but then are not given practical, helpful, and or realistic strategies to do so. Check out these links. This is a YouTube link.
Um, this link is also interesting and illustrates a need, perhaps, to counsel or inform athletes who are leaving your program. Because a lot of athletes struggle with once they've left their athletic program, how then do they maintain their body size, their, their fitness? They tend to gain weight and then have issues related to that. So we will have an assignment over this content, and uh, so make sure you look for that on D2L. And that concludes our discussion of athletes and eating disorders.